Let's now talk about some other useful things to know about doxycycline. So we've talked about how it's an oral medicine. It therefore has to be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream, and then from the bloodstream it will be distributed around the body's tissues, and then it will take effect in the target tissue. Therefore, to get maximum effect from it, you want to make sure the maximum amount is absorbed. So it's important to know that calcium and iron block the absorption of doxycycline. So you do not want to be taking it with a meal that is high in either calcium or too much iron. So for example, you don't want to take it with a glass of milk, for example, which would be very high in calcium. In addition, you don't want to be taking it with a calcium or an iron supplement. So this is a problem we often have in hospital. Loads of my patients are on calcium supplements and quite a few are on iron supplements. So I currently work in orthopedics, so all of my patients take calcium and vitamin D supplements. So you and those supplements are often taken first thing in the morning as well, which is commonly when you prescribe the doxycycline. So options you have are either prescribe doxycycline at tea time so that they're taking it a good uh, 10 hours after they've had the calcium supplement, or you could suspend the calcium supplement for the time whilst they're taking the doxycycline. Again, the same is true for iron. So if you, have a, if you are going to prescribe doxycycline for a patient, do consider is this patient taking calcium or iron supplements and should they stop taking those for the 7 to 10 days that they're going to be taking the doxycycline because then the drug will be more efficacious. So let's now talk about the side effects of doxycycline and there is only one major side effect that most people who take it will experience which is epigastric pain which is a brilliant term in medicine that means pain in the epigastric region, which is the region just underneath the chest, the top part of the abdomen, that is caused by stomach acid, either irritating the stomach or irritating the bottom of the esophagus or irritating the first part of the duodenum. It's that acidy sort of pain. So this is a wonderful term that covers reflux, it covers indigestion, it covers dyspepsia, all of these terms they can all be summarised with this term epigastric pain. So it's a wonderful term to start using. So loads of different antibiotics cause epigastric pain. And the reason is that the stomach has commensals. There are bacteria that live in the stomach. And for those bacteria to be able to live in the stomach and survive at that very low pH, they have to actually neutralise some of the acid to be able to survive there. So they're continuously producing stuff that neutralises the acid around them to make the little bubble that they live in compatible. Now, the, if you imagine loads of these bacteria all producing neutralisers to the acid, that has an overall effect on the pH of the stomach and stops the stomach becoming too acidic. And if you were to kill all of those bacteria suddenly by taking, for instance, an antibiotic that is effective against those bacteria, then suddenly your stomach's still going to be producing the same amount of acid, but now you haven't got that uh, neutralization effect of those bacteria, and therefore the pH is going to get even lower, even more acidic after those bacteria have gone. And that's how you can then get this acid-related pain in the epigastric region. So doxycycline is one of the antibiotics that's bad for doing this, and a lot of people, when they take it, do complain of epigastric pain, and therefore may need to be given either some Gaviscon or some Omeprazole or some Ranitidine or something along those lines to reduce or neutralise the acid. Doxycycline is quite good, however, compared to other antibiotics as far as diarrhoea is concerned. So the other major side effect, other than epigastric pain, that many antibiotics do cause is diarrhoea, which we call antibiotic-associated diarrhoea. And the reason this happens is that the rest of the gastrointestinal tract, so the small bowel and the large bowel, they are colonised by commensal bacteria as well. Loads of different species of them. And when you take an antibiotic, it's going to disturb the species that colonise the surface of the bowel. Indeed, a whole bunch of those species are going to get killed off by the antibiotic and some will escape the antibiotic, so some won't be affected by the antibiotic. And therefore, you're going to get a change of the balance that exists there. So some species, their population is going to massively increase and other species, their population is going to be wiped out. So the balance, the normal microbiome that you have there is disrupted 
Now, your bowel recognises that disruption quite often and doesn't like it at all and responds to it as it would if you had a viral infection of the gastrointestinal tract. So when you get viral gastroenteritis caused maybe by norovirus or rotavirus, these are in viral infections that you catch and they infect your gastrointestinal tract and the way your bowel responds to that infection is to massively increase motility to move all contents through the bowel as quickly as possible and get it out in order to try and clear any of the virus uh, or as much of the virus as possible because a lot of the virus might be contained within the contents within the lumen of the bowel. So that is the bowel's response to trying to clear an infection and it quite often reacts to this disturbance in the microbiome that is caused by antibiotics in the same way and therefore it moves all the contents through really quickly without time to absorb the water properly and therefore you end up with high volume very watery stool coming out the other side and lots of it hence diarrhea so a lot of antibiotics do result in antibiotic associated diarrhea. Doxycycline, however, as antibiotics go, is usually not too bad for causing this. Many people can take doxycycline and not get any diarrhea. And those who do, it will be very mild, mild changes rather than severe diarrhea. So it's not too bad for causing antibiotic associated diarrhea. In contrast, Augmentin, which we mentioned earlier, is an antibiotic that's absolutely infamous for causing antibiotic associated diarrhea, but it's less bad for causing epigastric pain. To finish the video, let's talk about some examples of other infections that can be treated with doxycycline. Now again, doxycycline wouldn't necessarily be the first line treatment for these infections. Instead, it might be the second line treatment if the individual's allergic to the first line treatment. And the first line treatment is often a penicillin type antibiotic. So allergy to penicillin is quite common. So you do end up using doxycycline in these sorts of situations. So first example is cellulitis. This is a type of skin infection, a deep skin infection, when the infection has gone actually below the skin into the subcutaneous fat and the bacteria can just spread up that layer of subcutaneous fat and it presents as an area of spreading redness, classically on the legs. However, it can occur anywhere on the body. Uh, in orthopedics, we often admit people with upper limb cellulitis where potentially they might require some sort of surgical washout as treatment if a abscess develops. If you've never seen cellulitis, I do urge you to Google pictures of it. So the first line treatment for cellulitis would usually be flucloxacidin, which is again an example of a penicillin antibiotic. But if the individual is allergic to flucloxacidin, then doxycycline is an option for treatment.